just a quickie little bit about end cloth, and I'm just gonna use this like weird low poly head that just sort of I use for everything because I'm a maniac. Um, so has anybody played with end cloth before? Cool. Um, yeah, so it can be pretty handy for random stuff. Um, I'll show you guys just like basics of kind of how to set it up, uh, and then one or two features that can be kind of interesting or useful for end cloth. Um, specifically to sort of constraints and things like that. Uh, so the first thing you want to do if you actually want to set up end cloth is go into your FX menu, same thing you would do for like particles and stuff. Uh, grab the skin that you want to be cloth. So in this case, I'll just do this head, do end cloth, and then just do create end cloth. Uh, and if we open the outliner, you'll notice that, so like here's the, the head that I turned into end cloth. Um, and then it makes a bunch of extra stuff. So it makes like the nucleus, uh, which I mentioned last week, which is also generated when you make particles. Um, so this has you know, a bunch of settings like your gravity, uh, wind speed, air density, sort of like random global settings like that. Uh, and then it also generates the little node for the cloth itself. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and give myself some more frames on my timeline like I did last week, and just make sure that playback speed is set to max real time. Uh, and definitely doing something that plays every frame. Otherwise, again, the sim is not going to actually work. Uh, and for grins, I'll turn on anti-aliasing and all that good stuff. So if we play this, you can see the head just sort of like starts falling through the air and gets like real creepy the, the farther down you go. Um, so just as a general rule of thumb, uh, it is good if you want like really fine rip, oh my god, that's awful. Uh, if you want like really fine ripple details in your cloth, it is good to do something a little bit higher poly than this. Um, I'll show you like a basic tablecloth drape uh, in in a few minutes, but I'm sort of like basic setup uh, for end cloth is more or less this. So you can see it's kind of just like falling through the air and slowly rippling and looking really really creepy. Um, so we put this back up. Uh, if we want this to actually fall and interact with the ground, uh, we can make the ground a passive collider the same way we did for particles, which is just select the ground, go to end cloth, and do create passive collider. And you'll notice that it makes this little end rigid one, and this is basically just the, the settings for that ground cover, uh, or for like the, the ground object. It's also usually a good idea to go through and like actually label these as you're working, um, but since there's only two of them, I'm just going to kind of ignore that. So if we play this again, you'll see that now the head just sort of like turns into cloth and does other really creepy things just sort of on the ground. Uh, let me turn off my grid because it's annoying. Uh, so if you guys want to modify some of the settings, uh, there, a lot of them, honestly, you'll notice that like they're kind of similar in some cases to the settings for particles. So like if you go into your end cloth and you look at um, collisions, all of this stuff is really really similar to end cloth, right? So like we have um, you know bounce and friction, stickiness, all that kind of stuff is pretty much the same. Uh, you will notice. And this is also the case for particles, but like can be more obvious with end cloth. You'll notice that it's sort of collided with the ground plane, but like not actually touching the ground plane, if that makes sense. So there's a few things that you can do to sort of look at that. Uh, and it mostly involves the sort of thickness settings in your collisions for both the end cloth and the rigid um, for the, the ground. So if we look at the solver display, there's a few different sort of attributes there. One of them is collision thickness. So if we turn that on, it's going to pull up this sort of yellow bubble around the head. This is kind of actually cute in like a creepy sort of way. Um, but it'll turn that on. And this is basically, if you sort of adjust the uh, thickness of your collisions, you can see basically where that would be colliding with other objects in the scene. So if I set that up to something like super high, like 0.6, um, and play that, uh, it actually exploded my sim, oh god, uh, because basically what happens is I, by setting the thickness up higher, uh, it sort of expanded that thickness through the ground, and end cloth simulations in particular really do not like clipping objects that interact with each other. Uh, so if you ever just like make sure that you're starting your sim, uh, ooh, make sure that you start your sim so that like the head is not in the ground, it's slightly over the ground. Um, and then, again, just try to avoid things where you have clipping, because usually that will sort of explode your sim, because the computer has no idea what to do with that. Um, so you can see here, again, we have the, the sort of thicker mesh. As we do this, it's simming even slower than it was previously. 
which is kind of terrifying. Um, but you'll notice it sort of starts colliding. If we go to our solver display uh, and turn off the collisions, you'll notice it's actually a larger gap than it was previously. Um, so I'm just going to go back and set this to point whatever it was before. Um, and you'll also notice, so I'll let that sim as well. It falls a little bit, also really creepy. Um, and you'll notice it's still not hitting the ground, and that's because we messed with the, the settings for the end cloth itself, but not the rigid ground body. So this one usually, again, if we turn on solver display to collision thickness, uh, you can see that it's sort of colliding right at the top of that uh, collision thickness. So what we can do is set this down to maybe something like 0.07, like the end cloth was. Uh, and if we go ahead and turn that off and play that, uh, it should theoretically fall a little bit closer to the actual ground. Um, if that's still not close enough, you know, you can set it, just kind of keep setting it lower, keep playing with those settings until it gets something that you're kind of happy with. Um, any questions on that? Just like sort of basic, just setting up a cloth and like messing with collision thickness? All right, cool. Um, so again, there's different features for this, also like stickiness and bounce. You can turn on wind in your um, nucleus if you want. Uh, there's a few settings for the end cloth itself. So if you look in like the dynamic properties of that cloth, uh, you'll see some stuff like stretch resistance, compression resistance. Uh, and that will probably actually be a little bit more obvious if I demonstrate this just like on a flat plane. Um, so let me, if you ever want to turn off an end cloth sim temporarily, just um, go into the end cloth shape and just unclick this little enable button. And that way it will not sim anything. Uh, so I just sort of don't want to compute this right now. I'm just going to ignore this. Um, so let me just make a plane really quick. Ooh, hello. What have I done? Ah, yes, we have glorious, sad default plane. Uh, so like I said, this is I'm just going to be doing like sort of a weird tablecloth setup. Uh, and I'm just going to turn this plane into end cloth. And actually, this so for a tablecloth setup, uh, this is fairly low poly, actually. Uh, usually you would even want like more polys in this. So I'll just do the same thing again. Select my plane, create end cloth. And the table is already set up as a passive collider, so that should be fine. So you notice as this falls, it just sort of starts grabbing the uh, table and just sort of like draping onto it in a sort of decent fashion. Um, so if we go through and there's a few things that I want to point out for this. So one, uh, if you look at the edges of the table, you can see that it's kind of draping like really like instead of just kind of going over the edge of the table like I would want it to, it's sort of popping up a little bit uh, and making like a weird sort of rim. Uh, this is actually one of the most common things I see when draping end cloth tables and it, the, it's literally just caused because you don't have enough polygons in your mesh. Even though this is absurdly dense, you need it denser. Um, so if that ever happens to you, just add some more polys into your mesh. It'll take a while to sim, but it's kind of like not avoidable for this kind of thing. Um, so I'm just going to, on this low poly mesh, I'll sort of show you some of the, the settings because it'll sim faster. And then I'll show you like a high poly mesh and how much better that looks on the tables and how much more detail you get for that in the, um, in the folds and stuff. So like I said, if we grab our end cloth and we mess with some of the settings, uh, these menus like never update if it's playing and it's very annoying. Um, so we'll just turn like stretch resistance off entirely and you can see that the table is just now, or the tablecloth is now just sort of falling down into nothingness, um, which looks cool. I don't really recommend doing this. Um, this has a really bad habit if you let this go for long enough of just sort of making really obnoxious computations and it'll just fall for eternity. Um, but if you do sort of need like stretchier cloth, um, you can turn that down. Uh, sometimes modifying settings live will throw your table uh, or throw whatever you're doing kind of crazy directions. Um, you can also turn off stuff like compression resistance. Um, and that's going to be, you know, if this cloth sort of falls down onto the table, uh, it's not going to compress or like fold as much, if that makes sense. Um, something like bend resistance is basically going to be something maybe a little bit more like paper or not paper, but something maybe more like leather where it's not, you don't want a lot of wrinkles. It just sort of is like a weird sort of stiff drape of something. Um, so that might be something good if you're making like some kind of weird tutu or something like that. 
Uh, you could set it like that so the, the cloth didn't like drape completely, if that makes sense. Um, yeah? So for something like in the case of leather, that would absolutely have thickness to it. Is there a way to simulate a cloth for thickness? So my person, and it's a really hacky way to do it. Um, I mean, then you can go in after and extrude it. But yeah. I've had issues with that causing like creases or things. You can sim it with thickness. I found a lot of times it kind of is more annoying than I expect it to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, you could just make this whole mesh thick, and then um, as long as self collide is turned on, it theoretically shouldn't collide with itself. Um, you would just need to sort of play with the settings because a lot of times, like if you're doing something, tablecloth is probably fine. If you're doing something like really aggressive with it, like dropping this head. Um, you would need to find a way to sort of keep that thickness or else it just sort of like mushes around into a weird shape that isn't what you expected. Um, but yeah, I usually, I usually personally do sort of extrude afterwards. Um, if, you, if you go in and you look at the, the end cloth uh, thickness, as long as it's like if you set that up to something that's roughly what you would want the thickness of your final extruded piece to be, then it can sort of like help offset the, the clipping from that. Any other questions? Cool. Um, all right, so really quick, uh, you will notice, and for some reason this happens on tablecloths sometimes, and I have no idea why, um, that it is sort of systematically sliding off the table. Um, if that ever happens to you, my usual sort of weird go-to is to just go into the rigid body for the table uh, itself and just make it really, really sticky. Um, and you'll notice that that pretty much immediately stops the tablecloth from falling off. So basically what would happen is the cloth would hit it, stick to it, and then just sort of sim out like you would hopefully want it to instead of sliding randomly off of a side. I don't know why, I don't know why that happens, honestly, in the sim. It's always like kind of weird. Um, so, yes, cool. Um, so there's like a few other settings. I'll turn bend resistance back down. Um, there's also rigidity, which is <laughs> usually doesn't like uh, being restarted, but it's, it's pretty similar a little bit to bend resistance. Um, it also, I feel like, is likes really slow numbers. Otherwise, it doesn't usually do good things. Um, but it's kind of similar, again, to bend resistance, where it'll just make your object less inclined to bend. Um, there's another thing that I want to show you that's pretty cool. Uh, that's input mesh attract. And I'll show you that on the head, because it'll make a lot more sense. Um, but there's some other things that you can fiddle with. Um, which, again, just sort of a lot of times I don't mess with these too much. Um, but it can be interesting to sort of go through and just like play with them and see what they do. Because uh, Ncloth has like a lot of just sort of weird settings in it. Um, but you can still get some decent, at least like shapes and stuff, without knowing what all of these do. And that's honestly kind of like a separate class. Um, but yeah. So if you're so inclined, again, there's also, um, you know, like force field generations you can do. Um, I'm partial more to like wind stuff. So if you want, uh, you can turn on some sort of like wind. Um, usually, I prefer to just ignore that and use the um, like. If I want wind, I'll go into my solver itself. And what are you doing? You're not simming. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Go into my nucleus uh, and then just turn the wind speed up. And you'll notice that it sort of starts blowing. Uh, in this case, it's going to stay where it is because my table is really sticky. Uh, so if you want to change the direction of the wind, right now it's set to go positive 1 in the x direction. Uh, so what I could do is, you know, if I wanted my wind to be blowing straight up for some reason, I could set that to like 1 in the y. And then the wind would just sort of be, maybe this is like, if you're trying to create like that sort of Marilyn Von Rowe walks over a train grate thing, you could sort of do an effect like that or something. Um, so that's usually how we'll do sort of wind and things like that. Um, I'm going to turn that off and restart that. Um, so that's like most of the basic sort of end cloth, just for basic cloth I do. Um, really quick, I, I did mention that I wanted to show you a version of this with more subdivisions. Uh, so if I just go and subdivide my mesh like I normally would, ha ha, <laughs> something like this is probably a reasonable density. It's also going to take a minute to sim. Um, so I'll just make uh, another end cloth. I deleted the first one. Um, if you guys ever delete the end cloth node itself, uh, it will just get rid of all the end cloth properties from the, the mesh. Pretty much the same thing as deleting a deformer, basically. 
Um, so you'll notice like this is definitely taking a longer time to sim, uh, but we do get a lot more resolution. Like if we look at, uh, so slow. Um, if we look at the sides of the table, uh, you'll notice, what is that, what are you doing? Um, you'll notice that it's done a much, much better job of wrapping around the side. Like there's not that weird sort of like pop that was happening before. Uh, and again, that's just because we have more resolution now. So a lot of times what I do is I'll sort of, if I'm doing end cloth, um, I'll do sort of like stages of working with it where I'll sort of test basic cloth properties with like a little bit lower resolution meth mesh and then I'll go in, <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'll go in and sort of up the density and like tweak settings from there if I need to, just because like, again, this obviously is taking way longer to sim, um, but you will see if you are, if you do want those like really nice sort of wrinkles and stuff in it, you do kind of need the extra polygons for that. Otherwise there's just like not enough information for the computer to actually do anything uh, that detailed with those little cloth bits. Um, so that's pretty much basic tablecloths. Um, anyone have any questions on that? Yep. So say with, the, um, when you had like the wind blowing, it was moving more, is there a way to save that movement, like out of phase Um, yeah, so that's, that's also caching. Uh, and I'm probably just going to write up like a little, uh, document on caching. Um, cause I have like a bunch of notes and stuff typed up for it. Um, and I'll send that to you guys. I'll probably actually just do that. I have like three hours before my next class after this one. So I'll probably just do that then. But um, it's fairly straightforward. It's basically, the process is pretty similar, honestly, to like setting up a export skin weight maps, which is sort of like click a button, make sure your settings are decent and then like go. Um, but basically what a cache is, is saving data from your simulation so that if you, want to render this on multiple computers, it ensures that the sim is the same. Uh, if you want to start rendering from frame 150 instead of frame one, um, it ensures that your sim is going to stay the same. Uh, and it also just sort of allows you to scrub through the sim. So it's basically just, it'll simulate it once and then save all the data from it so that you have it for later. Um, so you can also go through if you're so inclined and do multiple caches for like different iterations of stuff and sort of swap between them. Um, it's also kind of nice if like your computer for some reason crashes uh, you have the caches. I will say caches suck up a lot of computer space, um, but they are kind of necessary if you're going to do sim stuff. Um, any other questions? Cool. Uh, all right. So I just sort of mentioned really quick. So normally, so like say I was happy with this tablecloth. Um, if I wanted to save this file and like not have it as a simulation, just sort of have it. Um, usually I just sort of grab my end cloth and duplicate it. And you can see that it's going to save that shape. Um, if I run the sim, it's going to, you know, the, the original cloth is still going to run, but this little save shape is going to stay the way it is. Um, and then it's always a good idea again, like was mentioned before to go through and add a little bit of thickness. And for this, I'm just going to, I usually just grab the whole object and extrude it ever so slightly, uh, downwards, which for something like a tablecloth, if you're never going to see the bottom of it, I don't care if you extrude it. Um, if you're doing something like a thick blanket or something like that, um, I usually do find that it's, it's not a bad idea to actually thicken that. Um, so now we have like a sort of, uh, lightly thickened tablecloth that if we want, we can sort of smooth that and yeah, decent looking tablecloths. Um, so that, I feel like that's like one of the most common things people use end cloth for is like just draping tablecloths. Um, any questions on that before I show you some like weird sort of other things that I find kind of interesting you can do with it. All right, cool. So if that's the case, I'm actually just going to get rid of all of these uh, and go back to my weird head. Um, all right, so I'm going to just re-enable this, uh, this sim and drop it again. All right, so let's with this one, um, this will be a good demonstration of compression resistance. So if I just turn that off entirely, you can see that the head sort of just falls way flatter. Um, where the, the higher the compression resistance is, the, the less likely it is to sort of crush down. As I'm, I'm kind of picturing it like if you crush a soda can or something like that. Um, that's basically what compression resistance is controlling. Um, so again, we can mess with bend resistance if we want to. Um, get some weird sort of like jello motions in here. Um, rigidity is going to be, yeah, I don't know. Rigidity always explodes my sims. 
I always want to try to use it, and then it like just does weird stuff, so I usually end up not. Um, but the one thing, actually, let me just go back to my default settings really quick by just deleting that end cloth and making an entirely new one. Um, so what I actually wanted to show you, which is kind of fun, is if you scroll down under the pressure settings tab, uh, there's some weird stuff you can do, which is basically like treating your mesh like a balloon. So right now, if we set pressure to um, something a little bit higher, you can see that it sort of starts reinflating almost like a bouncy house. Um, so we'll set that to something maybe like two. And you can see it's sort of, it, oh god. I mean, the eyes have popped out backwards. Um, but it, it is basically simulating something like, you know, air pressure inside your mesh. So this would be good potentially for something like um, a water balloon or, god, this is like really disturbing. Um, uh, Okay, maybe don't set that to a thousand. Um, I meant to do a hundred. Um, so it can be good for like just sort of making like weird gooey meshes, and you can see like it has just exploded the mesh. Like there's so much pressure in here that it's it's pushed all of the ears and like all of the facial expressions completely out of the mesh. Um, that is something about this looks like something from the wild thornberries to me, and I don't know why. Um, so it's kind of interesting. You can um, key this to get some really weird effects. Um, if I you know, take this pressure settings down, we have something that kind of looks like sticky alien egg. Um, but if you ever needed to maybe do like a bouncy house or something like that, you could potentially do it this way. You can see, again, the more pressure is put in there, it kind of explodes. Um, I also just realized stickiness on my table is turned up super high, uh, which is why it's attached so aggressively to that. Um, it also occurs to me you could probably use like a, something like this for like a beating heart if you, for some reason, needed to assume a beating heart. Um, so I had a, like, sort of a lot of fun with pressure. Um, it's a weird thing to play with. Um, you can also turn pressure down, so that would be like basically sucking, sucking air out of something. So that could be good, potentially, for something like um, deflating an air mattress or something weird if you had to do some kind of effect like that. That is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, there's also a few things you can do, so like pressure damping. Uh, is usually basically just going to be, sometimes the effects are more obvious, um, but a lot of times if, you're, if your pressure is sort of creating like lots of jitter or noise, uh, you can turn on pressure damping and it will sort of help to relieve some of that like weird, weird jittering that's happening. Um, it's also one of those weird settings where it's like, when it works, it works great. Half the time I can never like recreate the situation where I need it to like demo what it actually does. Um, so just for grins, uh, there's a, let me really quick uh, turn off stickiness on the table because it's a little bit super excessive. Um, oh my. Uh, that's uncomfortable. All right. Uh, <laughs> I really, I really, pressure is like honestly one of my favorite settings in N-Cloth. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Um, also, where is my, oh, I see I've isolated. Um, I was like, where's my ground plane? Um, but again, can make some interesting effects. I also sort of picture that as like one of the uh, sort of weird like jelly toys where there's like a little bag that's like filled with water and like kids play with them. I don't know, I don't know how to describe that. Um, but you can do some really interesting stuff. Um, you can, I actually did for, uh, for one of the projects I did in school, I did most of this stuff with end cloth. So like I dropped, I was having issues with dynamic objects, so I dropped all the background objects with end cloth. Ah. Um, the shrimp are end cloth. <laughs> Pretty much like everything in this is end cloth. Like the eggs, all of those parts are just random end cloth. That's end cloth because I'm bad at things. Um, but you can use end cloth sort of in a lot of like weird, unexpected ways. Uh, like again, the eggs. And the eggs was something I just did um, pretty big. I messed with the settings like a lot. Um, but if you just sort of turn a sphere into end cloth and go back to your original settings and sort of drop that, um, it's one of those things where again, so like this one is where I use pressure setting a lot in my uh, the sim for class. Like if you turn on pressure, um, it'll do some like kind of weird stuff where when you drop it, um, it kind of makes like a weird jiggling effect, which was kind of uh, what I was going for for those eggs. Um, 
and it kind of does weird stuff depending on like what you're actually doing. But that is like 90% of the stuff I wanted to go over uh, with Ncloth. There is another sort of weird thing I wanted to show you guys really quick, um, but does anyone have any questions about that? All right. Um, so I imagine you can also make a tail with Ncloth if you want. Um, I think it's easier all around to do it with dynamic curves. It also calculates faster. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to show you guys is, uh, where is the setting? Uh, the input mesh attract. So that is going to be basically, right now this is going to like drop like normal. Uh, if we turn this on, it's going to try, oh god. Uh, it's going to try its best to sort of uh, bring the end cloth shape back to the original mesh in both shape and position. So if I set this up to one, it basically becomes a solid non-animating object. If I set this down to something a little bit lower, you can see like the pressure starts to take effect a little bit. And it becomes like a little bit gooier and weird and sort of starts falling. Um, so one thing you can do is, it's sort of like a way, I use it a lot as a way to sort of either offset, so like if, if I wasn't crazy about how much my, my shape was expanding, I could sort of turn this on. Um, and it would help a little bit to like not pop the eyes out so aggressively. Um, yeah, this is a weird, this is a weird, weird demo object. Um, but also I sort of use it as a way to start or stop my sims or basically um, potentially, and I'm not testing this, but it seems like you could sort of use it as a way to um, make looping simulations almost where if you sort of, uh, let me, so if you were doing something like a flag, you could sort of do an initial simulation, uh, duplicate a mesh like you did with the tablecloth and then re-simulate from that already posed mesh. And by messing with input mesh attract, it seems like you can maybe sort of um, start with it on and then like key it down to nothing. And then at the end of that loop, key it back up to one. So it's always hitting that original shape. Um, that's my theory of like a weird sort of thing that you could do with that if you wanted to. Um, other things to be aware of is if you go down somewhere. There's like, haha. Uh, so there's a bunch of maps under each of like, for you can do this with collisions, uh, with the dynamic properties. Um, but there's this extra drop down where it lets you basically put in maps for your object. So if I say maybe wanted to key the input mesh attract for different parts of my object so that like some parts simulated and some parts didn't, um, you can do that as well. So. Uh, just like another weird, uh, weird sort of example. Don't look at this. Uh, don't look at most of this. Uh, where I use this was for this like weird two-second sim, where you can see I'm using basically using end cloth to jiggle the stomach, but the character is rigged and the skin is sort of following that rig. So I use input mesh attract for that, and I just sort of keyed a map for it. Um, so again, if you go down and you want to do something more than just like a, a specific value for any of these, um, open up that extra maps drop down. And you'll see that there is like this input mesh, uh, basically a place to put a map in for input mesh attract. Um, so I'm just going to go in and throw in a checker texture. And I imagine this is going to look really, really strange. I'll make it less checkery. Um, so theoretically, if I sim that, you can see now that like parts of the mesh are uh, behaving as input mesh attract, and the other ones aren't. Uh, if I modify, should be able to like modify that texture. Uh, to sort of continuously mess with that. Um, but if I do something really, really crazy, like you know, go in and maybe uh, set my pressure to like 10 again, um, it'll be way more obvious. You can see that, like, again, some parts are, are sticking pretty close to the original mesh, and some parts are very much not doing that. Um, so depending on what kind of maps you put in, um, you can affect stuff like that and do sort of things like the stomach. Um, and this also works, so if you like I said, you can do this with rigged characters. So if you turn your bound skin into end cloth, uh, you can do the, the map for, um, for this input mesh attract and maybe have like a really jiggly stomach or like some jowls or something like that, uh, where you still have all your weight painting and stuff where you want it. Um, but you just have like a little bit of that extra jiggle that will sort of like respond to however the character's moving. Um, and they also, again, have that for stuff like stretch resistance. 
Um, pretty much all the other settings have little maps you can put in. Um, so that was mostly my bit on end cloth. Anybody have any questions about that? OK. Um, so I kind of like a lot of stuff. It was mostly just like, I want you guys to be aware that this exists. Um, if you guys don't remember what any of the settings were, um, this is you know, recording. I'll throw this video up. Um, so you can go back and double check that. Um, but end cloth is really handy and also kind of fun to play with. Um, so other thing, uh, I guess uh, also last cloth, or <laughs> last cloth, uh, last call for questions about sort of particles or any of the other stuff that we went over. All right. Uh, in that case, the only other thing that I really want to go over with you guys is, let me just get rid of all these rich bodies. Uh, oh, that was actually, there is one more thing for end cloth, sorry guys, uh, that I wanted to go over with you, and that is, uh, let me just make this like five. Um, so if you want to do something like blowing leaves or something weird like that. Um, I'm just going to, so I just have like, ah, what am I doing? Just made a bunch of planes, and I'm just going to mesh combine these guys. Uh, and if I go ahead, I'll turn on, in the spirit of doing blowing leaves, I'll turn on some wind speed, uh, maybe in the actual x direction and not y, because it's a stupid setting. Um, uh, and then I'll just turn this uh, weird thing that I've created into end cloth. <clears throat> and if I send that, uh, you notice maybe sort of that all the pieces kind of tend to behave as one. Uh, so let me just throw a hopefully more visible material on this. Green. Um, and you'll notice, so like, OK, interesting. Usually that setting is not turned on by default. Um, so right now, it's actually done what I wanted it to do. Uh, and it's treating all of these separate meshes as sort of individual pieces. Uh, so you can see pieces of it are sort of like falling off um, every now and then and continuing on. Um, there's a weird setting, which at least in previous for, oh, oh, nope. You know why it's doing that? Because I undid my mesh combine. Uh, so now there's six end cloths, which is not what I wanted. Um, so there is a way to achieve that same effect, but only have one end cloth object instead of like seven of them. Would you, would you actually combine my meshes? What are you doing? There we go. All right. There's now actually one object, end cloth, create end cloth. All right. Um, so now you should see that if I just assign these, Lynn, um, now that these are actually behaving still the way I actually want, which is weird. I'm glad they actually switched that to the default. Um, so if you ever, for some reason, wanted these to behave as a single mesh, um, and basically sort of retain the spacing between them, if that makes sense. Um, if you just go into your end cloth, and there is, interesting. Um, oh, that's really weird. OK, so they may have actually changed the way that simulations work slightly. Um, usually what would happen if I sim this is it would behave as like one object and kind of like tumble these all together as if they were still attached. Um, in which case, you would have to check on this use polygon shells button uh, to sort of have them behave as like separate little leaves or separate little cloths. Uh, but it seems like they've sort of gotten rid of that so that the end cloth always just sort of behaves that way, which is actually kind of nice. Um, interesting. OK, cool. So that point is moot. Um, I guess if, if you ever have an end cloth with like a bunch of separate pieces and it isn't behaving as separate pieces, um, just check out this little polygon shells button. For some reason, it's not doing anything right now. But if you ever had that issue, that's usually how you would fix it, is just turning this on. And then it would sort of split your mesh up. Um, but yeah, so that's basically end cloth randomness. All right. So for the fourth time, uh, <laughs> if you guys, uh, so dynamic objects uh, is basically a way to sort of, in the same way that dynamic curves let you sim curves uh, without manually animating how they bend. Uh, dynamic objects does basically the same thing. So if I just sort of make a bunch of little cubes um, of just sort of various sizes, I guess. Haha. -ha. Yay. Um, that was whatever. Um, so we have like a bunch of cubes here. And I'll just put, I guess, like a weird sort of sphere that some can fall and interact with. Um, and we want to say, turn these into objects. So maybe this is like. 
I'm feeling uncreative, and I'm just gonna say sugar cubes falling off of a table or something like that. Um, you can do that again with dynamic objects. Um, so basically, what you are going to want to do is go into same thing like your FX menu, uh, go into fields and solvers, and there are two types of rigid bodies or like dynamic objects. Um, so we have passive rigid body and active rigid body. Um, passive rigid body is basically just, it's not really going to be moving. It's just sort of there for other objects to interact with. It's just, you know, like a chair. It just sits on the floor. It's not really moving. Uh, an active rigid body is going to be anything that you are going to be moving or like throwing around in your scene. And you can switch, but like what you choose at the beginning doesn't really make a difference. All the settings are the same. It's just one checkbox is different. Um, so I'll make these guys active rigid bodies. Uh, what? OK, cool. Um, all right, and you'll notice that as I play this, uh, nothing is actually happening. And that is because rigid bodies, they don't operate off the nucleus, um, as far as I can tell. Actually, it occurs to me I might be able to actually hook those up to the nucleus. Um, normally, I'll just sort of add in separate force fields for them for like with their own gravity and stuff like that. Um, but theoretically, if I select all my little objects and the nucleus, I should be able to go to fields and solvers and assign to selected, hopefully. Nope, maybe. Yeah, OK. Um, that's my thought. So it seems like for some reason the nucleus doesn't really affect your rigid bodies. Um, so usually what you want to do is go in and just do different fields for like gravity. Uh, there's a bunch of other sort of random things you can do for like turbulence and wind and stuff like that. I'll get to those in a second. So let's put a gravity field on here. And now you can see that these objects are actually falling. Um, but we want them to actually interact with the different objects in our scene. So usually for rigid bodies, you would just sort of go in and do, so like I'll make the ground, um, again, fields and solvers. And I'm just going to make this a passive rigid body because I don't want this moving. It's just the ground. Um, and I'll go and I'll redo my sim. And you can see that now these sort of land on the ground and actually like stay there, uh, which is what I want. So you can do a bunch of different things. And I looked for a way to like modify the um, a bunch of different settings for these cubes and stuff at once. Uh, but as far as I could find, there wasn't one. If anyone happens to know of one, let me know. Um, but if you click on the cube, you'll notice that the there's like this little rigid body four node. Um, and there's like a bunch of settings for like bounciness. And you know, static friction, pretty much the same thing you get for a lot of the other dynamic properties. If I set the bounciness up really high, um, you'll notice that this starts bouncing a lot more. Yep. Well, now I'm curious. I would love if this works. I think I. Th I think the reason that doesn't work with these is because it labels all of the rigid bodies separately. So technically, I'm only modifying one of them at once, which is honestly really, really irritating. Um, wait, that bounce is really aggressive. Um, but yeah, which is why I was saying like it would be, it'd be really great uh, for these to sort of react separately. Although, it does occur to me that there is this allow disconnection button. And if you'll pardon me a moment of curiosity. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to duplicate these, do mesh combine, so that one object, fields and solvers, create active rigid body. So now, th mm, OK. So here's another weird thing about uh, rigid bodies is you'll notice that like this is a rigid body. Like There is a rigid body 10 node on this, but it's not interacting with the gravity at all. Um, so if that ever happens to you guys, uh, what you'll need to do is just select your object, select your gravity field, or like whatever field you want to affect it do fields and solvers, and then assign to selected. And that's going to say, hey, random field you selected uh, actually affect the object in question. Uh, so hopefully, if I send this now, they'll both actually drop. Uh, and you can see, so like the way this one is behaving is the way that mcloth used to behave, but for some reason now doesn't, um, which isn't at all what I want, because it looks ridiculous. So my theory is that if I turn on this allow disconnection in my rigid body 10, that these will sort of explode. No, OK. Perhaps I was mistaken. I feel like there has to be a way to do that. I just honestly don't know what it is. What? Ow. 
Um, you can, yeah, you can do that with mash. Although I'm not sure. I know it has like a, uh, a mutation or two that you can. Yeah. That is true. I don't know. I've never actually tried that with math. Mash. It seems like it could potentially work. I will perhaps experiment with that. Um, interesting. I've never really used Mash for Sims before. I usually just use it for sort of like populating objects. Um, but yeah. So, all right. Weird experiment. Kind of failed. Um, but yeah. So basically, um, I'm just gonna like turn on my sphere, and you can kind of see that like again, all of these have basically the same sort of settings for collision and stuff. If I make this a passive body, these all sort of like scatter from it and then they'll fall off the ground, etc. cetera. Um, if you ever wanted to do something, again, like make this really sticky, uh, you can totally do that. Just turn on, um, uh, you can turn on, why are you, oh, I see. Um, like static and dynamic friction um, and hopefully the objects would maybe like stick to them a little bit more. Um, where am I going? Settings. Honestly, half the time I can never remember where these settings are, and I just have to go through and like click through like a maniac. Um, but anywho, so the only actual difference you mentioned, I mentioned that the um, there's one one checkbox difference between an active and a passive rigid body, so one that moves and one that doesn't, and that is literally this active checkbox right here. So if I wanted the sphere to move, um, I would just whack, um, just hit that, and you can see that now that actually moves when the the squares hit it. Um, so you can actually, if you want to, um, key that on and off. Uh, so if maybe, so I'm thinking of something where you maybe had like a glass that was shattered, but you didn't want it to immediately fall apart in your scene. Um, conceivably, what you could do is something like, um, I will, I'm going to key this one off. So you'll notice like at this point, it's not simming. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and go to say frame 30. I'll set it. Don't give me that. I know you can set a key on that. Um, I will set a key, and then on frame 31 or 32 or wherever, um, I will check this on and then set another key. Uh, and you can see, if you can see the time slider, it's marked those keyframes. This is just like one of those stupid attributes that doesn't show up as being keyed. Um, but basically, what this should accomplish is at frame 30, that actually starts falling and basically becomes a dynamic object. And then, if you ever need to access that, um, or like you know, move your keys around, or like figure out what the heck you actually keyed, um, you can just select that object and go into your graph editor, and it'll actually show you that you've keyed the the active checkbox there. Um, at which point you can go through and like either you know delete the frames or do whatever you want to them. Um, that's honestly most of the settings for that I usually use for uh, these guys. I'm just kind of like play with the bounce and stuff to make them less weird looking. Uh, any questions on those? All right. Um, other thing I want to show you guys is soft bodies. I'm not gonna lie, I've had sort of mixed. Uh, Half the time these work for me, and half the time they blow up Maya. So hopefully you guys get the version that works. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and make another. Ooh, hello. Uh, make another ground plane. I just added a little bit of smoothness to this. Get rid of the extra hairs, uh, and then I'm just going to make this like weird sort of cylinder thing, and it's not going to be pretty. And I'm just going to like extrude, um, sort of extrude some blobs out of this. So basically. Um, what a lot of times rigid bodies are, or soft bodies are used for is um, stuff like foot, uh, footprints in the snow or like if you stick a spoon into like a piece of sugar or something weird like that um, where, ooh, uh, where you don't actually want like a, a hardcore end cloth simulation but maybe you do want uh, something like again like a foot touches an object and it like deforms it and then it just sort of stays deformed as it was before. Uh, so I've made this insane, weird pinwheel of terror. What is why? What is this cube here? Um, and I'm just going to keyframe that and maybe go to like frame 100, move it over, and just sort of like rotate a little bit. And what this is hopefully going to do is sort of simulate like really bad footsteps in the snow kind of thing. Um, so my goal is to have this this sort of deform when this weird 
cylinder thing hits it. Um, so to do that, it's pretty much kind of similar, actually, to doing dynamic properties, except for some reason this is set up under the end particles menu. So if you go to end particles, uh, and then there's like there's a bunch of different options. Like there's soft body up here, and then under this legacy particles, there's soft body down here. Um, if you ever see something that's like a legacy version of something in Maya, it's just saying this is an older version of this tool that will probably be phased out, but it's still in there for now. Um, so honestly, they both kind of behave the same, except this one I can never make work. So I'm just going to use the soft body under legacy. Um, oops. Uh, all right, hang on. It's yelling at me because this is apparently already. All right, fine. I will make a new plane if that makes you happy. Um, it was yelling at me because the, the plane, I think, already had some like extra um, passive collider stuff set up on it. So I just, because it's a dumb, easy shape, I just made a new one because I'm lazy. All right, so end particles, soft body. Uh, there's some settings with this. Um, so there's the make soft, which is going to take the original object and just mess with that. Um, there's, and then there's like duplicate the mesh and either mess with a copy or mess with the original. Um, I usually just do make copy soft because I like having backup objects in case I destroy it somehow. Um, and if you want, you can check like hide non soft object, um, et cetera, et cetera. But usually I don't mess with these all that much. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply that. All right. And you'll notice like nothing immediately interesting happens. Um, that is because I need to make this object a passive collider, which is under my end cloth tab. And this is where some get really weird. Like for some reason, a soft body is under your particles tab, and then to interact with it, you need to make an end cloth passive collider. So I'll grab this ridiculous object, do end cloth, and just create passive collider like I did for everything else. Um, you will actually notice that as soon as I made this a soft body, it's actually gone through and basically put a bunch of tiny particles, if you can see those, like on all of the planes. Uh, and this isn't necessarily something that you have you know, a lot of like crazy access to. Like You can't sim these particles or anything. They're just there to calculate collisions on your object. Um, but theoretically, if I play this now, nothing happens. Fantastic. Um, so this is totally going to be one of those weird versions of this that doesn't work ever. Um, so I'll try the new soft body and see if that does anything this time. No. OK, great. Um, wait for it. Do, do, do. All right. Yes. All right. So this is totally just going to be like one of those weird, weird demos that like worked half the time that I tried it on my own computer, but doesn't here. Um, if you ever, if you ever need to very aggressively uh, force collisions, and for some reason like, and I say this is like a last resort, but if you ever like can't get this to interact for whatever reason, um, what you can do, and again I don't necessarily recommend this, uh, is actually just make this object itself an emitter. Uh, so if you do n particles and uh, emit from object, there's this button that's like make collide. And that also literally never works anytime I try anything. I don't know what that's supposed to do. But um, if I make this object do emit from object, you'll see that it's now sort of like shooting particles out of it. And those particles are interacting with the soft body. <laughs> um, and you can, if you need to, uh, sort of go in and play with the settings. So instead of like a crazy waterfall of particles coming out of this, um, I basically just want the, where am I going? Uh, so we have n particle rigid. It's still rigid. Um, all right. So if we go into the emitter, um, and this is, I've just sort of clicked on my particles to find the emitter. Um, I can set that to surface, and that will at least generate particles from all over the surface of this object. Um, and basically, you just play kind of aggressively with the settings. Um, usually, what you'd want to do is um, generate like a burst of particles right at the start and then key that down to nothing uh, so that the particles just sort of stick to the surface. Uh, and then you would basically just 
have them not move at all. Um, so for like dynamic properties, um, I would let's see. I think it's dynamics weight actually, um, where you can see if it's not a great example, but like basically by turning off dynamics weight, um, the particles just kind of float in the air rather than actually falling. So the any kind of like gravity or anything isn't going to affect them. And then what I could do theoretically is grab my collisions and just do maybe like try turning the stickiness up really high, um, which does nothing. Um, there's like weird ways to do this, but I don't know. Basically, for the sort of soft body, you can kind of see that like as the particles hit the the object, um, it is sort of deforming and making like little tracks of you know like snow shoe kind of impressions. Um, so this is like one of those things where I mostly just wanted you guys to know that it exists. Um, but for me, I have like really crazy hit or miss issues with this, getting this to work. Um, so I usually try to just not use this. Um, if you twiddle kind of aggressively with the settings of NCloth, you can actually have it do a similar thing where it just like won't interact. It won't move at all, but if something like touches it, then you can kind of shift it, but that's also a pain to set up. But I don't know. I mostly, like I said, just wanted you guys to know this exists. If you guys, I don't think it's probably not useful for any of your guys' stuff this quarter, but if you guys want to use it, um, just kind of play around with it and see what you can get to, to work. I was also, when I was playing with this, doing uh, last year's version of Maya, so that may have possibly affected why this wasn't working. Um, cool. So. Any questions on dynamic objects, soft or hard body? All right. Um, so if that, I'm just going to make a new scene. Um, I had like, oh, really quick, um, dumb end cloth thing I just like wanted to show you guys like super fast. Um, there are different constraints you can use for, um, for, N cloth. So like if I wanted to make this really quick into like a flag or something like that, um, so I'll just go ahead and like set the set the wind speed up pretty aggressively high. You can see that oh god. Um, that pretty much just like crunches the crunches the end cloth off the scene. Where is my cloth? Okay. Great. It's all the way down there. Um, if you wanted to pin that in place to something, say maybe like a flagpole. Uh, what you can do is grab specific vertices, faces, edges, like whatever sort of makes sense for your object. And if you go up into, uh, where is it? Hang on. Uh, end constraint. Uh, what you can do is like component, point to surface. There's a bunch of different ones that you can kind of mess with. Um, I'll just do a component constraint, and that should sort of lock those vertices in place. You can notice it puts like a little sort of green outline on it. And then theoretically, if I were to, oh no, sorry. Um, wrong constraint. Um, ah, whoops, sorry, it was actually a transform constraint that I wanted, I think. Um, but you'll notice, so it was actually a transform constraint, um, but it'll grab those vertices and actually hold them forcibly in place. And now you have something that could be like, you know, a flag rippling from like a pirate ship or something weird like that. Um, and then if you wanted to, you could also play with the settings of your cloth and like have it be stretchier or, or whatever. Um, but I mostly just wanted to let you guys know that that existed. Uh, and then the other weird thing you can do, which is kind of cool, is a terrible constraint. Um, so if you ever needed to like rip your end cloth in half, uh, you could do that as well. Um, and there are ways that you can define how those terrible constraint or yeah terrible constraints work. Um, Sometimes it just sort of ignores what you specify. But theoretically, if I should grab these vertices and I go and go up to end constraint, uh, this one, I just want to do terrible surface. And this is the only option they give you. I usually just kind of ignore it and just hit apply. And theoretically, what should happen now is that if the force is great enough on this constraint, uh, it will sort of rip my flag in half. And if it doesn't rip immediately, uh, what you can do is go in and look at the, uh, so you can see we have, it's like listed this dynamic constraint. Um, and usually 
These are really good to go in and actually label, otherwise it gets really confusing what you're looking at. Um, but basically, there's the glue strength or the strength. Um, so honestly, both of these to me kind of, I think of them in the same way. Usually if I modify something, it's glue strength. Um, so think of this as if you weaken the glue to nothing, that's when it's going to tear. Um, so I'll just go ahead and let this play. And I'll set glue strength to 0. And you can see that as soon as it hits 0, it just sort of rips the, the cloth in half. And all of those pieces are just now lost to the sim gods. Um, so you can, again, select specific vertices if you like want a specific spot to tear um, and do things that way. Or what you can do is just sort of select your entire object, and then it will just rip wherever you want it. Uh, or sorry, it'll just sort of rip wherever the sim tells it to rip. So if I delete this uh, dynamic constraint, also delete this weird first one I did. If I just do my whole object and then do end constraint, uh, blah, 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 terrible surface, and go through, you can see like pretty much that one immediately ripped. Um, so that would be an instance where perhaps I would want to like set the glue strength a little bit higher. And you can see that like, this is, I guess, straining a lot more than the original. Um, like Even doing this like changes the way that that flag is moving. Holy crap. What? Um, but, you know, you can kind of go through and like more or less control when that rips. And in this case, I guess most of the surface, uh, most of the force from this object was being uh, exerted on these like little corner points. So that's where it ripped, as opposed to where I manually set it the first time. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it breaks in the middle, but there's still like ends on the side that keep the whole like bridge together. Mm. Is there a way to like make a hole? Theoretically. Um, yes, let us try to make a, a delightful bridge of probably sadness, but let's do it. Um, all right, so huzzah. And this is going to be, this is also one of those instances where I should be using more, uh, more geometry. I'm just not. Um, and let us make a, so I'm assuming that you're going to be animating the, the guy. So we'll just like set an actual keyframe, uh, somewhere, maybe like up here, um, and then just have him sort of crashing through like this, something maybe perhaps. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is theoretically you would have your bridge positioned before you do this. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and do create end cloth. And what I want to do is pin these uh, sides in place so the sides of the bridge just like don't randomly fall off into space. Um, so again, I'll just grab the vertices on each edge uh, and do end cloth. Where am I going? Uh, sorry, end constraint, transform. Uh, so that when I sim this, uh, this is what we get for our original bridge, um, or hammock, as the case may be. Uh, so what I want to do is go through and I'm just going to sort of select. So you said you don't want the sides to rip, yeah? yeah? OK, so maybe just grab sort of like randomly these vertices and do end constraint, terrible surface. So theoretically, those are the only places that are going to be like allowed to rip, basically, uh, which probably won't have any particular effect um, just on the initial sim. OK, apparently it does. <laughs> Interesting. We can see the basic premise of like how that would perhaps work. Um, so what I want to do is just uh, restart that, because that's absurd. Um, so I'm going to go through and set the glue strength a little bit higher so that it doesn't initially break. And what you'd probably actually want to do for this is maybe set this to be like, you know, less bouncy, obviously, or make it, you know, a little bit. I think it, we said you were doing um, uh, like a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I would definitely play with the uh, yeah. settings of this, because this is insane. Um, I'm just going to maybe. All right, great. Um, so basically, you need this object to interact with this. So theoretically, if you create a passive collider out of this random sphere, uh, then you should be able, hopefully, when it sims, uh, to actually have that sort of exert a pressure on the inside of this bridge and break it eventually uh, if you key it down far enough, which I did not. 
Let's just go. Ha 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 ha. All right. Key that. And delete that. All right. So restart my sim really quick. Um, this is very gooey. All right. So if this case, um, if you get something like this where it's just like stretching ridiculously, um, that would be perhaps an instance where you'd want to go in and just like mess with the, um, yeah, the, the keying of the glue strands so that your object doesn't mysteriously clip through it. Um, interesting. But yeah, so I mean, it, you can definitely do that. Um, what if I... Bend. Oh, yeah, bend resistance. All right. Well, that looks ridiculous. Um, but yeah, glue strength is also like one of those weird things where like sometimes it's like super tiny values can have just like really absurd differences. But yeah, so I mean, well, maybe don't set it down quite that low. But yeah, you kind of get the point, I guess, hopefully. Um, and also, if you start with a mesh that's actually triangulated, um, it tends to rip a little bit, not better, but you at least won't get like hardcore jaggy lines on the side. Okay. Um, so if you, and like that could literally just be doing like a mesh uh, triangulate and just using something like that. Because um, that way when it rips, and it's less relevant since it's just like a big square, um, but you'll get like nice sort of like wiggly lines on the side instead of like those hard little jaggy things. Um, Cool. Any other questions? All right. Fantastic. Um, cool. So that was like more or less just what I wanted to show you guys, I think, today. Um, so I think I'm just going to, is there any, is there any other stuff that you guys want to see? Um, I did have, in case you were interested, like a weird like mini mash tutorial about how to make stuff like barbed wire or Christmas lights, if that would for some reason be helpful to people. Cool. Um, all right. So this involves like kind of two things, and it's relatively straightforward. Um, so I'm just going to really quick uh, make a curve tool, uh, or make a random sort of curve. And I will do something kind of interesting with that curve, and maybe just qualify this as interesting. Um, so what we want to do is basically, if you look at barbed wire, uh, it is basically comprised of sort of kind of two parts, I guess. Um, and that is usually a sort of twisted wire with these like weird little thingies wrapped around it to cut people open when they touch it. Um, so to make that initial twisted wire shape, um, and this also works for stuff like rope, if you ever need to make rope, um, I'm just going to make a really, basically uh, sort of the silhouette. Imagine you were to like cut a piece of braided rope or like this barbed wire apart. Um, make the silhouette of that. So I'm just going to mesh combine these little dudes. Uh, so you can kind of imagine maybe this would be like the cross section of two pieces of wire. Uh, and then you're just going to go ahead and position them. You can actually extrude geometry along a curve in case that was like not something you were aware of. Um, actually, someone in, someone in one of my last classes showed me that, and I got very excited by it. Um, so to do that, you just want to position that little cross section you made at the closest point as close to you can as like the beginning of the curve. Um, and then to actually extrude it, for some reason, you need to select the faces on the object. So select the faces themselves, and then shift click on the curve. And you just want to do a regular extrude like you would um, for doing like poly modeling. And you notice that, like immediately this happens, which is clearly not what you want. Like we were hoping for like a curvy sort of wire. Um, basically, what's happening is just not enough division. So if you just go ahead and add in I'm just going to say like 70 divisions, um, perhaps 80. Uh, it will sort of conform to that curve. And you can see, yep. Uh, so one thing I remember seeing at one point, I was watching a tutorial for this, and I cannot refine this, is that when you extrude like that, it puts more divisions like in curves than on other parts. Yes. Like Um, I know of a way to do it. I don't know. It seems like there has to be a better way, but yes, there is a way to fix that. Um, yeah, so you will notice that, like, uh, let me just uh, mesh display reverse this so you can see it. Um, 
So if you look at this, like this is like super crazy dense, and then this is like no divisions at all, and it looks really stupid. Um, so what you can do if you go into your curve and do uh, go into like the curve menu and do rebuild at the bottom. Um, what? I think that's what it was. Yeah. Um, so this is like works pretty well. So I'll set this to something maybe like twelve, um, and just make sure that rebuild type is set to uniform. Basically, what this is going to go and do is uh, recreate your curve with 12 points in it and have them equidistantly spaced uh, from each other. So if I hit Apply, it does reshape my curve a little bit. Um, but if you go ahead and then look at the actual object, you'll notice that the, the shape and like the distribution of those like polys is way more uniform than it was previously. Um, so that's usually how I do it. I just sort of tend to rebuild my curve, like shape the curve and then rebuild it before I even extrude stuff. It just kind of seems safer. Um, but it will sort of like work and readjust uh, as long as you don't delete history on this object itself. Um, any other questions? All right. Uh, so kind of cool, I guess, if you need like a cable or something like that um, for you know, like a phone cable or whatever. Um, but in this case, I want this twisted. So what I'm going to do is just select my uh, little extruded object and go into the, if you go into your channel box, you'll see the sort of history on the object. And I'm able to go down and select that extrude face that I did. Uh, so if I wanted to, I could go in, I could add more divisions. And you see that I like, added a little bit more geometry. Um, in this case, what I'm looking for is this twist value. And you'll probably have to enter some ungodly enormous number, like 3,000. And you'll notice it does start to sort of twist that wire. Um, again, probably we'll need to enter some really high value for this, uh, especially like the longer the curve is. But you can get some pretty nice looking twisting for that. Uh, so that's the basic premise of how to make, in this case, the base of barbed wire. But like obviously, this would also work for like braids. Well, not not braids so much, but like you know, twisted rope or hair or string or like whatever kind of weird thing you're trying to make. Um, so, and the the fun thing about that is like, so you'll notice if I grab one of the control vertices on this curve and move it around, it'll also drag my object with it. Um, be aware that doing that, um, if you change, if you're like dramatically changing the distance between the CV curves, it'll sort of start to mess up the spacing and stuff of your, your object. Um, but this, if you set this to be something like a dynamic curve, it would actually animate this for like, you know, a gentle blowing in the breeze or something like that. Um, so to actually get the, uh, the little barbs on, actually, I could be festive. I think barbed wire is actually a better, de better demo. Um, so I know a lot of people actually are making like Christmas lights. Uh, and you could just, if you needed to make Christmas lights, just sub out lights for spiky pieces of metal. Um, but I'm just going to make a really quick helix. Uh, I don't know, maybe something like that. And just, because nobody wants 50 subdivisions. And I'm just going to be like really cheap and easy about this and be like, all right, extrude. And now we have spiky pieces of death metal. Um, so I'll delete the history on these. And this looks, I don't know. I have to, I feel like I must make this look kind of halfway decent. All right. Um, so we have this. And what I'm going to do is use mash to distribute the, uh, to distribute this object along the curve. So mash is like really, really useful if you guys have never used it before. And I made this really strange, uh, where like this is not going to fit around my wire, but whatever. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly hide that object because it's kind of in my way. So select this weird little barb that we've made. I'm just going to go ahead and freeze the, the scale on it because I don't like the scale. Um, and if you go into this mash tab right here, uh, first thing you want to do is actually just click on the very leftmost button for create mash network. And by default, it's usually will just sort of, you can see it's, it's hidden my original object. Um, so that's still there. And it's just made like a weird duplicate of 10 of these objects, uh, which is clearly not what we want. Uh, so if I open up, and this is just like, uh, this little mash editor is basically just the sort of outliner for your mash stuff. It's just like the equivalent of that. It makes things easier to select. Uh, so what you can do is if you, you notice here's the, the original sort of mash network, and it automatically creates a distribute node. So this is basically going to be how do you want to lay your objects out. Um, so if we go into that mash distribute, um, we can set uh, more or less points. Uh, we can change like the distance on the x. But this is still not what we want. I don't just want a weird line of barbs. So what I'm going to do is look at the 
um, distribution type, and there's a few different things you can set up. Um, so you can attach these to a mesh if you want. So like if I have a, if I just casually make a sphere, I could have grabbed my head, but I'm not feeling that fancy. Um, so if we set this to mesh, uh, you'll notice it kind of switches some of the options, and it's like what uh, what mesh do you want to use? So I'll just grab P sphere one and drag that into the input mesh, and you'll notice that it's just sort of attached these all uh, to this sphere, and it's kind of it's really handy. This is great for using stuff for like adding sprinkles to like ice cream or like weird stuff like that. Um, you could also use this for like adding grass to rolling hills, that kind of thing. Um, so if I go back to my distribute node again, you can change like the number of points. You can also change like how this is going to attach. Um, so scatter is just sort of randomly on the surface. Vertex is going to go on a per vertex basis and just sort of attach one of these barbs on every every vertex in the sphere, which is kind of actually interesting looking. Um, but in this case, I actually don't want mesh. So I'm just going to uh, go ahead and set this back to linear and call it a day, get rid of this weird circle. Um, so if we want to attach this on a curve, you'd have to go uh, just click on your little mesh network in the mesh editor. Uh, and you'll notice there's a bunch of just sort of different nodes here that you can add on. Uh, so what I want is the curve node. Uh, and you can actually mouse over these, and it'll be like, distributes and animates mash points along a curve. Like It gives you actually fairly useful descriptors of what these do. Um, so I'll click on that, do add curve node. And basically, all it's waiting for is me to input a curve into this ginormous box up here. Uh, so if I grab my original curve and just sort of middle mouse button drag that into the box, uh, you'll notice the, the distribute node is still not doing what I want, but it has changed from the original uh, positioning that it was doing. Uh, so if I just, this is like one of those weird things, you just have to go back into distribute node and set the distance x to 0. Uh, so by having this offset like it was by default, it sort of pulls your objects away from the curve. Uh, but you can see now that they're actually pretty much following that curve exactly at this point. So if I go on to my, back into my curve, and I modify the step, uh, you can see that the little barb sort of starts spacing out a little bit along the curve. Uh, so we have this, uh, and this is like pretty all right. Uh, we could add more barbs if we wanted to. Um, kind of don't really want to. Uh, so any questions on that so far? All right. Uh, so you will notice that like these are not clearly are not sitting correctly on the uh, on the original wire that we put in. Um, so what I'm going to do is just unhide the original little barb that I made. And the any of your mash objects are going to automatically retain any changes to like scale. This is the cartooniest barbed wire I have ever seen. Uh, it's going to retain any of like the scale or changes or whatever you make to this original object. So like if I... Um, Ah. you know, went in and like extruded a face out of the side, all of these guys are going to get another face extruded out of the side. Um, so it's basically just like a standard instance, just a bunch of them at once being controlled at the same time. Um, so I'll just sort of use that and rotate these. So these are like kind of positioned where I expect them to be. I'll hide that. And this is like almost done. Uh, but I'm not in love with the way that these, all of these curves, or like all of these little barbs are facing the exact same direction, which doesn't quite feel as random as it should. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go back into my mash network and do, uh, there is a node called random. And I'm just going to click on this, do add random node, and interesting. Normally that's more of, a, I guess, an obvious effect. Um, so by default, it starts out with sort of doing, with the, with the use of a random number generator, um, tweaking the positions of the x, y, and z by one unit. And apparently, I've made this larger than I usually did because it's not having much of an effect. Uh, but you can kind of see, like, if I you know, mess with this, um, it's just sort of twiddling a little bit with the positioning of the objects. Um, so in this case, I don't want position. I just want rotation. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just sort of go through, and apparently it's the x rotation I want. Uh, so I'll set this randomness to be higher. Uh, and you'll notice I just want x. If I start doing like y and z, they're going to start not lining up on the, the curve. Um, so the higher you set this, the basically the more random it is. 
And you can see that now the barbs are a little bit more organic feeling, kind of like facing a bunch of random directions. Um, you can also go through if you want and play with the seed. Uh, this, if you've ever taken a coding class, it's pretty much just sort of like a weird number it uses as like the default thing to start with as it like calc uh, calculates the randomness. Um, you don't really need to worry super a lot about like what a seed is. Just know that like by changing this number, you can sort of change the random positioning of your objects if you want to. Um, you can also go through and like key, you know, like the strength of your the randomness, um, a bunch of stuff. Usually, I just sort of set this and call it a day. If you ever wanted to, you could also play with the uh, the randomness for like the scales of your objects. Um, so that can be good for doing if you have you know like a bowl of fruit or something like that that you've instanced. You can sort of change the scale of the fruit a little bit uh, so that it also appears a little bit more organic. Um, but that is the basic bit about how to make a sort of barbed wire effect. Um, if you were doing something like Christmas lights, um, you can do kind of like the same, uh, same basic principle, except instead of maybe doing so much aggressive randomness, you just sort of did a left, a, like a little bit so that the lights were all just sort of still hanging downwards or something like that. Um, but MASH is crazy powerful. There's way more stuff that you can do in it than just this. Um, but this is sort of one useful thing that I thought was kind of cool. Um, other thing, and again, so like your MASH network is still going to follow your original curve. So if I grab these control vertices and move them around, um, your MASH network is also going to sort of follow that. Um, it is a little weird because like the spacing will change with your object, which is kind of unusual, but it does work. Um, but yeah, any questions on that? Cool. Um, but yeah, so MASH is like definitely really, really fun for sort of populating objects. It also is sort of helpful if you are, there's like one more really, really silly MASH thing I want to show you guys, and then I'm actually done. Because um, I've actually used this to uh, populate, uh, I've used this to actually populate stuff on like armor or whatever that I was making. So if you have like a specific, specific sort of pattern that you want to follow for something, um, and say maybe I want to just you know add like a button on a shirt or something weird. Um, I'm just gonna make my sad fake button, and I will just make. Uh, so here's my here's my ridiculous looking little button. Um, go back into my mash. Just make a quick uh, mash network for that. Uh, and here are my objects apparently. Um, so you'll see like it, as I add more little networks, um, I can you know expand them and collapse them like I would normally. Um, so I'm just going to go in and set the distribution type of this to mesh. It's going to ask for my mesh. So I'm going to grab the P plane that I've just created. And these are now attached onto that. Um, I am going to maybe turn the number of points up. So I had 10 divisions in this. So I'll set this to 10 for number of points. And I want to set the method to, there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, you can set it to vertex uh, so that if you, uh, where's my? Uh -huh. um, so you can see it's kind of just like snapping one point to each of the vertices on the object. So if I do more, it'll sort of like systematically go through and populate those. Um, this could be an interesting way to make like a pier or something like that, where you need like lots of equidistantly spaced little sticks, basically. Um, what I did usually is just do face center, and that's going to snap all of these directly to the center of the face. Um, so it'll also overlap it. So if you have like more more than 10 points, um, it will sort of start adding them back on top of each other. Um, but this can be a really convenient way to just sort of go in and like add, again, equally, sp equally spaced buttons to something like a shirt or some other weird thing without having to manually position all of them. Um, so it can be kind of cool for that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all my weird sort of like how I most commonly use MASH stuff. Um, you could also just like, if you wanted to, again, put this on a dynamic curve. Um, you would just want to grab the dynamic curve and extrude along that instead of doing the uh, original curve. Um, but yeah, cool. Any questions on that or any other random things before we go into Open Lab? All right, cool. Um, in that case,